The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, good morning. good morning. This message has come directly out of what God has been speaking to me. And it, the title of the message is Walking in Light. And there are four points that we're going to be covering. The first point is what do we want? I know what we were singing about, saying, telling God that we wanted, but what do we want? Next, what is God's will? What is God's way, and how do we walk? So what do we want? Some of you may have known the story of my spiritual journey from the time I was a little girl. Looking back, most of you can see God's hand moving in your life long before you knew him, right? Scriptures that he gave you, movies he used to to quicken your heart. I just read a book by... uh, uh, written by a Jewish man who, as a little boy, saw Ben-Hur. Have any of you seen the old Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston? It gripped my heart as a little girl, too. Just, I don't know about modern remakes, but that is an amazing movie. So if you can live stream it or something, I strongly suggest that. It made more of an impact on me than the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, which was also very good. But when I was growing up, God used several characters in movies and books that really touched my life. One was the Song of Bernadette, and it was a story of theology was kind of wrong, but anyway, um, a, a little girl who actually became the envy of nuns after she went in a convent because of her close relationship with the Lord and the experiences she had and um, the presence of the Lord that she walked in. And it made me see that there is a realm that's far superior to the realm of the physical created universe. The next character, I bet a lot of you ladies read Jane Eyre or saw some of the movies Jane Eyre. Are you familiar with that? Well, I loved the book. None of the movies lived up to the book as far as I was concerned, but it wasn't Jane and later her relationship, love relationship with Mr. Rochester that thrilled my heart. It was the young girl in the um, orphanage, Helen Burns, and she was so close to the Lord that when the teacher stood her on a stool and mocked her and made her stand in front of the class, Jane asked her later, how could you bear it? And she said, oh, it's such a small thing. The teacher was just uh, making my faults plain to me. And Jane was rebellious. Jane says, oh, I wouldn't have stood it and all that. But just the life lived by this Helen Burns and her closeness to the Lord and how little the things and even the chastisements of this world affected her. She lived, and in the book she died, because she had tuberculosis, died in peace. And I, for years I kept the book by my bed, and I would just read that portion in the book over and over again. The other was Melanie Wilkes, and the way she lived as a Christian in Gone with the Wind. This was long before I ever heard the gospel, but just a transformed life a changed life, a life that's clearly not of this world. And then I got saved, and all that came back to me, to be changed like that, for it to be so obvious to everyone around that this one belongs to God. And have a life that spoke, a life that was a testimony. And soon after I was saved, the Lord gave me a scripture. 
it's one of those early, early things that happen only to baby Christians because I didn't know there was such a thing as a concordance and you could look up scripture verses. But somewhere I had heard, somehow I had heard, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And that is my heart for him. It became my life scripture, my railroad track scripture. And so I was asking the Lord, Lord, where do I, how do I find that verse in the Bible? And I went and got in the car and turned on the radio to a Christian uh, radio station, and the speaker was speaking about that verse. So, and then later I learned you could look things up in a concordance. And the other verse, that was Jeremiah 29, 13 through 14a, because 14 says, I will be found by you. And Psalm 27, 8, David, speaking to the Lord, says, saying, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So then in the process of getting saved, right about the time I was learning about the Bible and scripture verses, I took a course at the church I was attending on, of all things, the Beatitudes. Now, I was told that my life changed so much just from the initial salvation experience that the word of it got all the way to friends, former friends who lived in Texas, how much I had changed. But, I longed for far more transformation in that because as I was taking the course on the Beatitudes, I thought, there's no way I can live like this. I can't do this. And there was a man who, who had memorized the Beatitudes and went around to different places, you know, dressed like Jesus doing the Beatitudes. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but I can imagine people sitting there as Jesus was speaking these words on the Mount of Beatitudes, thinking the same thing I was thinking. So, I actually got so discouraged because I really thought as a believer, I wouldn't sin anymore. And I was so shocked that I could quite easily still sin. I could lose my temper, think an ugly thought, my behavior on the outside was mostly pretty good, but you know there was a lot going on on the inside that other people didn't see. And so I became discouraged, and actually a woman prophesied over me, um, the Lord is saying, return to me, because I had done exactly what Adam had done when he sinned. What did he do? He went and hid from God, right? So then I started reading books. I got my hands on a book. This was back in... Uh, about three years after I was saved, got my hands on a book called Reese Howell's Intercessor. And by this time, I was reading books like They Found the Secret, Deeper Experiences of Great Men and Women, um, Deeper Experiences of the Christian Life and the Great Men and Women of God, books like that. I didn't read contemporary testimonies. I read Madame Guyon, I read Fenelon, I read Molinos, I wrote I read Fox's Book of Martyrs in the modern day version from the 1900s. That's what I read. And I discovered people like uh, Watchman Nee's books and all that. I would go sit in the Christian bookstore and probably needed a couple of entirely new bookshelves because of the books that got in my head. So hungry for God. And then I heard, however much your life changed, at initial salvation, it will change that much more at baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so then I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and I didn't, it wasn't that much of a life change. I could speak in tongues, my prayer life was deeper and all that. I thought there's something missing. There's got to be something more. And now at this time, um, in the 70s and 80s, you pretty much couldn't breathe I don't think what we call spirit baptism is what happened on the day of Pentecost. There's, there's got to be more than this. And now a lot of people 
are saying that, that we have got to have far more of God than we have now. And you look at the state of the church, and you look at the state of the world, and my goodness, darkness and evil is so blatant now, it's clear it's going to take a mighty company who walk in far more than what we have walked in up to this point. Now, I don't know about you, I suspect because you're here, that you also have a passionate desire for more of God, that your heart, that you're pursuing God, that you're longing for, for more. Otherwise, I think you would get really tired of hearing our messages. That's what I think. So the first thing the Lord has been asking me is what do you want? And now I'm asking you, what do you want? Are you satisfied with church as usual? Or is your heart crying out for the glory of God? A couple of years ago, back before the Lord brought us into the experience of the replaced life here at this place, um, I, was cons I was like David looking around at the world. You know, he looked around and he said, uh, who is this army? Who is this unphil uncircumcised Philistine? that would defy the armies of the living God. And he cried out, is there not a cause? And I was thinking that looking at the world. You talk about the armies defying the living God, the armies, earthly armies defying the living God. I mean, um, just about, well, probably actually cursing Jesus openly, blaspheming God and um, coming against the believers in God. And so a couple of summers ago, every day in my prayer time, I would cry out to God and say, God, I present my body a living sacrifice to live as completely for you as the Savior did during his earth walk. He said, I only do what I hear my Father say. I only do what I see my Father do. The words that I speak, I only speak what the Father gives me to speak. And he walked in perfect loyalty and obedience even up to the death of the cross. Jesus didn't do anything that he wanted to do apart from God. He didn't turn the stones into bread because he was hungry in the, in the great temptations in the wilderness. He won the victory on every point as far as standing firm, as far as bodily appetites. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. As far as worldly acclaim, all those temptations into spirit, soul, and body, Jesus withstood in the wilderness. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that today in John 14. But next, I would like to talk about the Lordship of Jesus. He lived under the Lordship of his Father, didn't he? So what are we called to do today? To live under the Lordship of Jesus. To speak what he wants us to speak. To love as he loved. To do what he wants us to do. And there's a really, really scary scripture in Luke 19, 12 through 14. This is right before, right prior to the triumphal entry right after the Last Supper, right before the triumphal entry, and Jesus is talking to the people. And he said this to him, which is, he said this to them, which was sort of shocking. He just laid it all out. He spoke so plainly. He spoke this parable. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return, which is what Jesus did. He came to earth to set up, establish a kingdom. He was the king. And then he returned to heaven. Of course, that's not the end of the story. And it says, so he called 10 of his servants, delivered money to them, and said, do business till I come. We have business to do until the second coming. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's pretty shocking. 
But you know what? I'm afraid much of the church, maybe without quite that attitude, are going about living their own lives rather than seeking the things that belong to God. So, what is God's will? God has an eternal purpose. He has, of course, a will for each person's life, specific things, a specific will. He has a moral will, his moral laws. But he also has an eternal purpose. And part of his eternal purpose has to do specifically with us today. See, God has a need. He doesn't just need Sunday morning believers. That's not God's need. Jesus came as the captain of our salvation, the pioneer of our salvation, to return us to the glory of God. God needs sons and daughters restored to the glory. He was the captain of our salvation for bringing many sons and daughters back to the glory that was forfeited in the Garden of Eden. That is, it says in Ephesians 1, that is Father God's inheritance in his people, not lukewarm Christians, not backslidden Christians, but ferocious, holy, and invincible sons and daughters. John Wesley stated what the world needs, which is for God's will to be done, in saying this, give me a hundred men who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts, and I will shake the world for Jesus. That is exactly what God's will is. That is exactly what God wants. And I believe that um, a first step was taken in that direction back when we experienced the replaced life. Summer before last, began to experience it. You see, in the replaced life, Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God. It's Jesus living in us, knowing him as the living Christ, as the living word that we no longer have. Because Jesus died and he took all humanity to the cross, we died to that old sin spirit that we inherited from Adam. We were made to be a container, but the devil hijacked humanity and put his sin spirit, his sin nature in us. But when Jesus died, we died. And when the body is dead, the spirit Spirit leaves. And we were raised together with Jesus, with a new spirit. But first of all, we have to understand that that happened before we can appropriate it. So a whole, I would say the majority of the people attending this church have appropriated that. And moreover, we learned that unlike the Second Great Awakening, where people just listened to people talk and some people got it and some people didn't, we discovered that it's impartable through laying on of hands to bring people into that experience once they've heard the truth. So, and then we had somebody well known said, I have been in this little church and I felt something I have never felt before in my Christian life. I felt holiness. Some people attending a conference came looking they said, there's some holiness in this building. And they came looking until they found this room where the holiness lingered. Because you see, God says, be holy for I am holy. Well, be like me when I first got saved and I took that course on Beatitudes. I thought, I can't do that. No, but he can. He is made unto us holiness or sanctification. He becomes holiness in us. And what do we do then? We surrender to him and let Jesus be Jesus in us. We don't try to live the Christian life. We yield and allow him to live his life through us. What a way to live. It has just transformed my life. And of course, Dennis and I have loved God so much and we've always been close to God, but just the difference it's made in our day-to-day -day living is wonderful. Now, 
Around the year 2000, the Lord took Bob Jones in a vision to Satan's trophy room. There he saw all the precious things that the enemy has stolen from the church, but the most treasured thing of all, the most treasured object in the enemy's possession was the banner of holiness. The banner of holiness. Do you know in Christ is the only ground we have where the enemy cannot touch us? If we sin, when we sin and don't repent, if we sin and let that sin remain in our lives, the enemy has access to us. That's why we've stressed forgiveness so much and toxic emotions, which are from the enemy's kingdom. Those are flags the enemy has planted in your heart, and it's our sin if we don't deal with them through forgiveness. A, a wonderful, amazing, marvelous gift of forgiveness that's always there when we yield to Jesus, and he does the forgiving. Of all the things stolen from the church, Bob saw that this was the most significant. And we look at scriptures, Leviticus 19.2, you shall be holy for I the Lord am holy. Why? Why does he want us to live holy lives? Because he wants to reclaim us from the kingdom of the enemy. He wants to tell us how to be free from the warfare, how to not allow the enemy to touch our lives. And this same verse was not just Old Testament, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 6. But as he who called you, Jesus, is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it's written, be holy for I am holy. And Hebrews 12, 14 through 15 says, pursue peace with all people, which is a forgiveness lifestyle, and pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Can you see a connection here between holiness and having more of God? Or him having more of us is really the truth. And then looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now, I don't know how you've learned grace. Perhaps it's unmerited favor. Well, that's what grace and gracious means in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it means so much more than that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross through shedding his blood. We now have had the barrier removed so we can begin to approach the Father because his eyes are too pure to look on sin. So we needed a remedy for the sins that we'd committed, and that comes through the blood, and that's something Jesus did for us, and it was done, and that's a grace that gives us right standing with God for our legal position before him. But there's another aspect of grace. Of course, grace is a person, grace is Jesus. We can grow in grace the more we let Jesus have of our lives. We can grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. Grace should be our constant living condition. We experience the work of the cross for the replaced life, for our personal victorious life. But there's another aspect of the cross. There are three great levels of the cross. And you can see them in the three rooms of the tabernacle and so forth and, and outlined in many, many places in Scripture. But we can grow in our Christian living. Thank goodness I'm not like when I first started. And thank goodness that, so that was my forgiven level. I didn't know I had been set free from the dominion of sin at that point, but I was sure forgiven. And, and now we're living on the level of the replaced life for personal victory. So sin really won't have dominion over us. And also we're free from uh, the, the aspect of the law in Romans 7. That's Romans 6, that sin no longer has um, dominion over you because the work of the cross has set you free. 
And Romans 7 is, speaks to self-effort, trying to live the Christian life. And if you go back and you read Romans 7 again, you'll notice it's full of I, 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 all the way through. And then at the end it says, thank God for Jesus Christ. I don't have to do this myself. I am free. I've entered into the perfect law of liberty. He is the perfect law of liberty. Jesus is the embodiment of all the moral commands of God. Now, we don't have to live by Levitical law, but Jesus came to fulfill the law and then live it in us. And he is love. And we know that he who loves keeps all the commands of God because love brings no harm to your neighbor. So love himself now lives in us as our life. So now, I read a comment about what Bob Jones had said, and it says, this implies a couple of things, that the banner of holiness has been stolen from the church. It implies more than the fact that there are many backslidden Christians. And, of course, we know the reality is that few even have a biblical understanding of what holiness is. A lot of people think holiness is legalism. A lot of people think, uh, I could not possibly be holy because I'm wearing jewelry and I have lipstick on. And more than that, I have eye makeup on, too, and I'm not going to give it up. <laughs> So holiness is not, is not dressing plainly and going without jewelry and makeup and, and paying attention to certain social sins that are bad so you don't do those. And that's what the holiness movement devolved into after the Second Great Awakening, unfortunately. Holiness, by the way, is going to be a primary characteristic defining God's people in the last days. Now that's the first hidden message in this that it's not just that people have backslidden, it's that people really don't know what true holiness is. The second hidden message is that true holiness will be the devil's undoing. Because God, when God has worked his holy son in us, the enemy cannot touch us, but we can sure touch him. Now, I want you to picture for holiness the throne room of God with the cherubim and seraphim crying out day and night, holy, holy, holy. Holiness is the unique and defining characteristic of God himself. We're told his eyes are so pure he cannot look at sin. That's the, why he needed to send his son Jesus for his blood to cover our sins, which opened up a way back to Father God for us. Now, the throne room of God in heaven is the nerve center, the power generator from which the universe was created and now sustained. Holiness is the supreme and spiritual nature of God himself. What did Isaiah do in Isaiah 6 when he was caught up before the throne of God? He fell on his face and he said, Woe is me, I am undone. My lips are unclean and I live in the midst of an unclean people. And so what God, did God do? God purged him. God cleansed him and then sent him back with a greater message than he'd had before. That's what God is going to do to a large company in our day. He's going to take us and he's going to cleanse us and he's going to send us out to the world to do what the church is powerless to do now. Amen. That's why God needs his army on earth. Now, holiness cannot flow in and through our lives until we know that we're properly connected to the Holy One in us. We now live in union with the One who is holiness in us. God is preparing a mighty army. He's raising up His Holy Ones because only they can stand when the world needs them the most. 
Now these holy ones are going to walk in the powers of the age to come. Look that up. We're going to taste the beginning of the coming of the kingdom of God on earth because the age is shifting now and we're transitioning into the very beginning stages of a brand new age. Hebrews 6, 5, those who have tasted the powers of the age to come. These holy ones will see the dawn of the kingdom of God in a way possible to no other generations. These holy ones will have an understanding of not just salvation, but the fullness of salvation and being filled with the fullness of God. Ephesians chapter 3. They will love God more passionately, deeply, and completely than any other previous generation. This is the final generation. I really believe that those of us who are older are connecting with the millennials and generation Zers or centennials or whatever they're going to be called and the younger generations. And we're going to link arms and come together in a mighty generation like that which the Lord has never, what the earth has never seen, like what the Lord has never produced on earth. And we're going to cry out in the spirit and the bride say come. There's going to be a bride's revival because this company, this army is a bride before it's an army. This final, in this final generation, multitudes are going to arise from every nation. They're going to arise as God's holy one. The ones Daniel talks about, the, one who, the ones who will do great exploits in the days to come. And we're going to see the nation shift. And we're going to see the power of God released. And we're going to be the ones who are going to walk in the greater works because we will know the great one. It is God's will for us to walk in God's love, God's holiness, God's power, and God's glory. Now in the book, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and I really never understood this until recently. You know, we know about theophanies and angels coming and people having visions and things happening. Do you know in the wording of the Old Testament, that that was actually Father God himself who visited man, formed Adam, breathed into him the breath of life, and it was Father God, Yahweh, who walked in the garden in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. Glory is a defining characteristic of the manifest presence of God. There's holiness, but the expression of God the Father is His glory. That's why in the tabernacle, you don't see the glory in the outer court. You don't see the glory in the holy place where, where there's the lampstand, the censer, and the table of showbread, but you have the glory in the holy of holies. You have the glory in the Holy of Holies. Now this is amazing to me too, because where else do we see God the Father meeting with man? <coughs> On Mount Sinai. And Moses said, show me your glory. Well, if you see God, God's glory, you're, you're seeing the Father. And God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and covered it with his hand, and he called all, caused all his goodness and his glory to pass by Moses. Now that's pretty awesome. All Israel um, said, oh, we don't want any of that. That's pretty scary. And so they said, you go up and, and, and be with God and be in the glory and all that, but uh, we'll wait down here and hear what you have to say. But you know, what really gripped me in learning that that was God the Father who came down in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. In Numbers 12, a situation happens. Now we know that during the time Moses was in the wilderness, the 40 years, that he communed with God the Father. Then that he spoke with him. I'll tell you what, only God the Father could have dealt with those people. So a situation happened in Numbers 12 and Moses and Aaron were speaking against Moses. And God the Father said, okay, you three, I'm going to come meet with you. And he said, you know, I've spoken to prophets and visions and dreams and other ways, but with Moses, 
But with Moses, I speak to him face to face as a man speaks to another man. How dare you speak against my Moses. And of course, we know that Miriam was immediately stricken with leprosy. But that was God the Father. Now, he was wrapped in the cloud, but that was God the Father. Now, in the book of Revelation, what do we see again? The book of Revelation ends with the throne of God, the light of God, and the glory of God. So the glory of God goes all the way through the scripture and because of Moses and David's relationship we know there's no reason why we can't say to God I want to know you I want to know you as Moses knows you I want to really know you I want to speak with you that way I want you to have my heart so completely that I become a trusted servant and a trusted friend to you and see, that's what my heart's been crying out. Last, last year, it was, Lord, I present my body a living sacrifice. Something needs to be done. Use me. Now I'm saying, God, I want to really know you as I've never known you before. I want to know you as this book tells me I can know you. As this book tells me it is possible to know you. So then we might ask, well, what is the way? How do we get from here to there. What is the way? In Genesis 28, 12, Jacob dreamed with his head on a rock, speaking of Bethel, the house of God, or a place where God the Father can dwell. He dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to the heavens, to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. That means they were not only just, they didn't descend first, they were ascending and descended because when the house of God is formed, the angels have easy access. Isaiah 35 8 talks about a highway. A highway shall be there. What in a special place with, with God's holy ones? A highway shall be there for God's people, and it shall be called a highway of holiness. You see, in Matthew 13 14, we enter by the narrow gate, which is the cross of Jesus. And then we walk the constricted way, the holy way, the holy highway, by yielding a life continuously surrendered to him. And then in John 1, 51, Jesus repeats the words of Jacob speaking to Nathanael and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you, Nathanael, will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's what it means that Jesus is the way. Now, in the replaced life, we've learned that uh, this pulpit will always be a piece of wood, and I will never be part of this pulpit, and this pulpit will never be part of me, because physical matter is has unique properties where it, it can't mix. As a matter of fact, I can't, much as I love Dennis, we are still bound by we have physical bodies. We can't be, and by the way, love is a passionate desire to be one with someone. But there's a limit to how one we can be with another person while we're in the flesh, right? But not so with spirit. Not spirit interpenetrates. Spirit mingles with spirit that we're God indwelt. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So we're joined to the Lord. As a matter of fact, we already have the glory and light and life of God in fullness within us. But the barrier to that is on our part. And our, our knowledge, our entering in what Jesus has provided, and... Um, how we walk, what we want. Do we want him? He won't reveal himself to someone who doesn't want him. Now, the way. I want to share something with you, just a little bit aside, maybe a little bit off message slightly. But go back and read the Gospel of Matthew with this knowledge. You see, every other place in the Bible it talks about the kingdom of God. Why does math in Matthew it say the kingdom of heaven? Read it this way. 
the kingdom of the heavens. Now, what does that mean? The kingdom of God, let me get my scriptures in case I want scriptures. The kingdom of God includes all of God's realm and his workings from eternity past to the new heaven and the new earth in eternity future. Now, in the kingdom of God, we have several different um, dealings of God with mankind. We have the dealings, the dispensation before Moses, from creation of Adam to the Ten Commandments. Adam to Moses, kingdom of God. And then we move into Moses to John the Baptist, which is the nation of Israel in relationship to God and his kingdom, right? Something new happens when the king announces that the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near to you. Because see, God no longer, with Jesus, God no longer dwelt just in a temple. His glory all of a sudden, when Jesus died and the veil in the temple was rent, and all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, you have all these wild believers who now had the glory in them. They became temples. They became dispensers of the glory. The reality of the kingdom of the heavens was revealed to them, and they lived in that reality. The church, the real Christians, the overcomers, the kingdom of the heavens... The kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. The reality of the kingdom of the heavens, the appearance of the kingdom of the heavens spreading in bodily form through believers all over the earth and turning the world of that day upside down. Now, the kingdom of the heavens will also be prominent during the millennial reign of Jesus. Right, the kingdom of the heavens will be manifested in a way after the second coming that will be most powerful of all. That's the culmination of the kingdom age or the kingdom of the heavens age. But then we know that eternity future will go on, the kingdom of the heavens. So what does this king come announcing? What does he tell us? Well, first of all, he tells us things like what his citizens are going to be like. And the first quality of citizens of the kingdom of the heavens, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Now what does this mean? We didn't grasp our spirit we didn't grasp our nature that we had before we were saved. We did not hold it precious. We did not hold it dear. We willingly come to the cross and surrender and say, Jesus, when you died, I died. I want nothing of me. I surrender fully to you. Live your life fully through me. Everything I had before, I count as rubbish, Paul said. Poor in spirit. The only one worthy is Jesus, and he's living in me. How should I grasp something of the world or something of my appetites or something of my desires apart from him? It, ta it does away with all inferiority or superiority. This is the way of humility. This is the way of no pride. There's nothing worth anything in me but what Jesus does in me, how Jesus lives through me. This is all that matters. And you know, how can we be proud when it's Jesus doing it? And how can we feel bad about ourselves for our past failures? That was just us living with that old sin spirit. That wasn't the real us. The real us is the new creation fused together with Jesus. Amen. 
That's what he paid for when he died, not just to get a bunch of sinning believers walking around saying, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. No, he's perfect. And the Bible says be perfect because he is perfect. The perfect one can live his perfect life through us if we get out of the way and yield. So in Matthew, it describes the kingdom of the heavens. But then the book of John, I do believe this is still my favorite book in the Bible. And here is a situation that happens very exciting. John 14, that's probably my favorite chapter in the Bible right now. Right after the Last Supper, I mean, the disciples were freaking out because he was talking about the cross and, and, and going somewhere and stuff like that. And he did all sorts of strange things at, at, the, at the Last Supper. And then, so they've just gone through this. But Jesus is so thrilled he can finally lay it all out for them. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be concerned about the things you've heard and where you're going to go in a few days. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes through perhaps one of the most misunderstood scriptures in all the Bible. In my Father's house are many mansions. He's saying the Israelites understood that Father's house was the Holy of Holies. He's saying there's room for all my children to have a part of the Holy of Holies. He said, he's saying, okay, I'm coming to take you back from where you started in Genesis. I'm taking you back to the Father now. I go to prepare a place for you. And in a few days, I'm going to come back. And because you're joined to me in the Spirit, when you're going to experience my resurrection, you're going to experience my ascension. You're going to experience my seating with my Father together in the throne room in heaven. You're going to be seated in heavenly places in the Spirit in me. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And then we have, um, then Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the way. I'm the way. It's in the spirit that all this is going to happen. You joined with my spirit. And all these things that I've experienced, you're going to experience too. And then Jesus explained he was taking him to the Father and um, Philip said, oh, why don't you show us the Father? Ah, uh, really? I mean, after three years, they were really pretty dense. And, and so Jesus says to Philip, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Our spirits are joined. The words I speak, I do not speak on my own authority. And the Father who dwells in me does the works. He does the mighty miracles. It's the Father in me because that's the place of authority and power. Is the throne of God. And he says, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe for the work's sake, if you're kind of dense on that one. And then he says, most assured I say that he who believes in me, greater work shall he do because I go to the Father. And the sentence stops there, but the thought doesn't. Because I go to the Father, and I'm taking you to the Father, and the Father is going to work mighty works through you. And then he says, You will know that I'm in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. All this is all just mixed up and mingled together. And then he says that he... He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Speaking here of the moral commandments and the words of Jesus. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then verse 23, and we will come. We, my Father and I, we will come to him and make our home with him. That's the way. And a few short days later, he breathed resurrection life into them, and then the Holy Spirit came to them. They were baptized or filled with the fullness of God that Ephesians 3 talks about. 
Here's something beautiful as far as the way. You know we're called living stones, right? The Bible calls us living stones. That means we are God's building material. Now, when the new Jerusalem is described in the book of Revelation, what makes up the new Jerusalem? Not little stones like pebbles out of a stream, out of a riverbed, or stones that you would um, chip out of limestone or hew out of a quarry. Gems, rubies, and diamonds, and emeralds, precious stones. That's what we are. We are precious stones. We someday are going to be the building material for the new Jerusalem that will shine with all the glory of God radiating through the beautiful facets and colors of his children. In the book of Hebrews, um, sometimes misunderstood character is talked about. Melchizedek, our high priest, now, those of you who've had our teaching know that Melchizedek, our high priest in the heavenly realm, is Jesus, our Lord Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews, well, first of all, Hebrews is written to reluctant believers who want, weren't sure that they wanted to go to the distance with God. They were thinking about stopping short somehow. And so this is an encouragement for, for them to move forward to the place of God's throne to the throne of grace which we also know is the throne of God spoken about in the book of Revelation and we have come not to the outer court of the tabernacle or temple not to the holy of place but we have come into the holy of holies in the heavenly realm where God the Father dwells well in the tabernacle and in the temple the high priest would go into the holy of holies once a year. And of course he'd have the linen garnet, garments and he'd have the breastplate and on his shoulders he had precious stones that had engraved all the names of the children of Israel. And on his heart, on his breast, he had the stones on which were engraved the twelve tribes of Israel. When our high priest today goes into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of our Father. He bears us on his heart, speaking of love, and on his shoulders, speaking of strength. He is the way. He takes us there. In him, we go there. In him, we are there as our great high priest. Heaven is not a place we're going to someday. It's a spiritual life we're connected to right now. Now, what God has been speaking to me is the very title of this message, which is Walking in the Light. Now, in the replaced life, we know Jesus lives his life in me and as me. But walk is a metaphor for our Christian living. And so, what is our Christian living supposed to produce. We live in conscious inner union with Jesus. However, we still have a world filled with temptation and sin and enticements. Is this not correct? However, we do have, we are kept by the power of God within. That the world may have a magnetic world, but God has a greater magnetic pull. We are kept by his power. So if we do give in to temptation, we return to him quickly for cleansing and get back in the place of our fortress within. Our fortress within. Temptation to sin is not sin. It is enticement to sin. Temptation always stimulates our natural desires, which we will have until we have a glorified body. So, but temptation is not a bad thing because it's our testing ground and it gives us great opportunity for great victories. So we can look at it as our temptations are made particularly for us. They're designed especially for us to show us our weak points so that we can have victory over them. 
but we don't wallow in that because that's not the real us. The real me is fused together in an inner union with Jesus. So it's like I'm married to Jesus. If I flirt a little with the world, I haven't lost that marriage. I repent of the flirting and get right back to the, the one that I belong to. Now, in the Christian walk, what we're looking for is a step-by-step, moment-by-moment experience of abiding in the vine. Because life is a daily combat with great need for daily conquest, the New Testament has a lot to say about a believer's daily walk. Almost every epistle expounds on some aspect of grace available, a new revelation of what we can appropriate in our Lord, and then as a result of that appropriation, then how to walk it out. How should we then live after knowing this new aspect of God's grace? Ephesians takes us to the summit of revelation in our union with our ascended Lord and tells us to walk worthy, walk in love, walk as children of light, and walk circumspectly. That means be careful how you walk. John 3 explains the new birth. Romans 6 tells us we are free from sin. Romans 13 tells us about how God loves. John 15 tells us to abide in the vine. Then we see the daily walk of victory, perhaps most clearly in John 1. And John tells us how to live and walk as Jesus, our example, lived, in, lived and walked. And one of those ways that John emphasizes is walk in light. Referring to walk in his light. Be honest with what the light reveals. And in that honesty, we call sin what God calls sin and deal quickly. The whole emphasis of John 1 closes the door to dishonesty in our walk. It closes the door to excuses. It opens the way for us to quickly agree with God and allow those things in our life that need to be exposed to the light to be exposed to the light. It's a crucial moment when John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And a verse, another verse talks about his cleansing blood that continuously, continuously cleanses us as we walk in the light. The same light shining on the sin is also shining on the blood. And all that's required is our honesty and for us to keep walking. I want to pray us through some things that uh, in light of what Jennifer's talking about, walking in the light, uh, years ago, and it's in our new book, uh, How to Flow in the Will of God. God in his goodness and his graciousness took me in hindsight and showed me the stages of my own walk in the light. You know, you, you can feel peace in your heart walking in the light that you have doesn't mean that you've got all the light that you need, correct? That's growing in the grace and in the knowledge. And this thrills me. If you're a note taker, I would write this down and then go slow because this is my entire life being laid out in five increments. But it was clearly showing me that growing in grace, I wanted proof that I was growing in grace. Because some people grow in Bible knowledge and think that they're growing in grace. It's not the same thing. All right? You're not necessarily growing in experiential knowledge, you're growing in head knowledge, right? So here's, here's the, uh, and this is in our, in our current book in the back somewhere, I think in one of the, the latter chapters. The last final chapter. The final chapter. But when I said, Lord, you know me, I'm, I'm, I want to see the proof. I've always needed proof. Like I would hear preachers talk about, we're going to take you to another level. And they're always talking about levels, but I never knew what that level was. I was supposed to, by faith, take it that we were at another level. I want a tangible internal transformation and internal no-so about a level. And so here's what the Lord did in hindsight now. So this is my whole life. This is not something 
uh, you're going to, oh, I'll take that right now and get it in five seconds. But basically, he showed me, as the baby Christian, real rough around the edges, the minute I would close my eyes, I could touch him, spirit to spirit, touch. There's people going, spending their whole Christian life going conference to conference looking for a touch. I could do that at day one. Day one, I would touch him, and I was aware that that was Jesus. That was him, not just ink on a page. It was him and that touch. And when I stayed there in that touch, and there was where the battle was, because I had to wean my flesh, you know. My flesh, I'm a talker. My flesh wanted to get up out of the chair, walk around, because activity comes easier. And God says, like a wean child with its mother, I've got to quiet your flesh. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh, Dennis. Well, I figured, I'm missing something by not shutting up. So I went back and I would feel the touch. And my flesh didn't want to sit still. I wanted to quote scripture. I wanted to make decrees, declarations. And God said, yeah, you're a talker, all right, but I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, but you're going to learn how to, you're going to, learn how to sit still and listen before you talk. You don't have anything to say until you've heard something. That was humiliating. <laughs> I thought I knew plenty. And he said, shut up. So touch. At some point, by reason of relationship, out of intimacy with God, don't ever have somebody tell you, you can't te I can teach you how to get intimate with God. And this is it. But again, it's going to be hit and miss. You're not going to do it perfectly. Just like I didn't do it perfectly. I found out that touch was intermittent. It was like he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. You know, his words would come, stuff would be quickened from the scripture. But then I'd get in the flesh. And I'd say, that was good. How do I get back there? Well, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> and so then I would, I would go back and I'd, I'd actually have to sit in a chair to get still. But my mind wanted to go 1,000 miles an hour, like the Energizer Bunny. And God says, until you quiet that, you're not with me. Like a weaned child with his mother, I had to quiet my soul within. But it led to the next step. And that touch went to an embrace. I'll tell you what, I, I could kiss Jennifer intermittently, and that'd be nice. <laughs> but to hold her indefinitely, embrace is better than touch. I'm challenging you in your relationship with Jesus. Don't just be that fast drive-through, carry-out window Christianity to where you're satisfied with a little goose bump every now and then. That touch, if you appreciate, I used to use the word, it didn't translate. When I was trying to disciple Jennifer, I had a hard time getting from touch to embrace. I would say, you, when you feel that touch of God, you cherish it. And it wasn't translating experientially to her. And I, until she said, oh, you mean after you touch, absorb. And for some reason, that word sunk in. And I said, yes. So as soon as you feel life on a scripture or on your prayer time, don't go to the next thing. Stay there, absorb it, and it grows. All right? You're getting the point now. I'm going to race through this. But trust me, this was a, this is 40 some years of developing and increasing in that knowledge of intimacy. And after I went from touch to embrace, embrace, it got to the point where my guy was going to pick me up. I was in a carpool and I felt like I was being extracted from God. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to go to, I'm in union. <laughs> and that's when God had to teach me, no, you, we can go to work together. <laughs> but it was like that's, he says, and here was the transition that made it easier. There's special time and all the time. That broke me of that in and out of prayer. No such thing. He never left. So then I have special time. Now when the guy's honking the horn to pick me up, I... I don't feel like I'm leaving God to go to work. 
It was like, I'm le special time, now I'm walking in all the time. And embrace became a constant, and you know, our, some of our books, first book, Practicing God's Presence 24-7, that came out of a lifestyle, that came out of intimacy. Then, and practicing His presence does not mean you're talking the whole time. Practicing His presence is you're with Him, and you're enjoying His personhood. Now, I want to challenge you to go from that touch to the embrace, but then when I stayed in embrace long enough, I found a secret. And this is not something you can learn out of a book. You've got to learn out of a relationship. I learned that that embrace produced something in me, and only hindsight showed me what it was. It was called internal, for me, this is still me-oriented, satisfaction. It's like, wow, this is, what every, this is what Christians have to find. He is my exceedingly great reward. I don't need stuff. I'm not guilty about not praying for stuff. My petition was more of Him, greater surrender. And so I saw that that embrace produced something you can't get any other way. It produced an internal satisfaction. And then that satisfaction flip-flopped. This is a good thing. Before I went to the next level, he showed me that satisfaction right now is kind of you-centered. Like, God is my exceedingly great reward, and the emphasis was on my reward. Then it switched. It was so satisfying that I wanted to reciprocate. And what it did was it began to gradually form a mindset in me. A mindset means a consciousness of the way you think most of the time. You can't make that happen. Most of the time, I wanted to satisfy his heart. I wasn't needy. I didn't need to feel satisfaction. I had it in him. And if I had the satisfaction in him, it translated to reciprocity. We love because he what? First loved us. Once that satisfaction is in there, then it's not dead works and it's not willpower and it's not trying. All of a sudden, out of that satisfaction, you want to do and live and breathe and act to satisfy his heart. That satisfaction then, flowing out over time, took to the next level. That satisfaction pointed to how to love properly out of what the scripture calls abounding love. Let your love abound. Now listen to this. In that scripture, and this is what the Lord used, that one scripture, he says, out of that satisfaction that's overflowing out of you, which is a proper world emphasis, others. See, that's a key turn, because most of Christianity can stay your whole Christian life, me, myself, and I. Others-oriented satisfaction flowing out, abounding love, overflowing in real knowledge and all discernment. That means experiential knowledge of me. You're experiencing me because I'm doing it through you. You're just along for the ride, so to speak. You're cooperating, but it's me that's loving through you. It's me that is focused toward others. And I saw, well then, to satisfy his heart, I just go with the flow. And that's the over, and then you enjoy the real knowledge, but you also then cultivate the eyes of Jesus because the overflowing heart is the heart of Jesus. Your discernment is becoming redemptive. It's not what's wrong with people. You start seeing the gold in them. I made pastors really mad in the prophetic, didn't we, when we traveled? Because I would go prophesy to their problem makers, the ones that the pastor's ready to wring their neck, and prophesy their potential. And they used to get really indignant. He's missing the mark. He's, he's, he, he don't know that person the way I know that person. Yeah, because you know them by how they irritate you. <laughs> They're not in my congregation, so I haven't been really tempted that way. I'm basically just seeing what the Lord sees in them. Yeah. 
Have you ever heard somebody get a prophetic word and you're sitting there going, oh, brother. Huh? Well, that's something in you that needs fixed. Because you're seeing with different eyes. You're not seeing with what Jesus is seeing. Redemption is the name of the game. Right? You have to see past the demonic to the potential. Past the flesh to the potential. Because you're, you're supposed to be ministering hope to them to bring them out of. All right. So now, satisfaction points to the abounding love. The abounding love is what I believe God is bringing the church into if we will grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, a revelation of the Father. The abounding love points to the heart of the Father. We can talk about it theologically, but I'll tell you what, until, you, until you're in others' mode more than self-mode, you're only talking about something you're not experiencing. But the Father's heart is basically overflowing toward sons and daughters. And what does abounding love point to? It points to the heart of the Father. What does the heart of the Father do? What is the ultimate eternal purpose that's clearly laid out in Scripture? And it's your purpose, is to bring sons unto glory. I don't care. Anybody that's studied their Bibles, you know in Ephesians, that is your ultimate purpose. Everybody gets hung up on my gifting and my talent and my significant place. Where do I fit? You know, I've heard that my whole Christian life. All of that is insecurity talk. That's really what it is. It's because you're still finding your way. I'll tell you what, if you, you cultivate intimacy with God just using those five steps, and be honest, where am I? Am I still looking for a touch? Or is embrace comfortable? If I found satisfaction in the embrace, have I been willing to really now see, instead about me being satisfied and, and comfortable in that relationship, am I really wanting to be motivated to bring satisfaction to his heart? Whose satisfaction am I after here, mine or his? You know, you can stop at any point. But God in his goodness and, and basically said, the eternal purpose is to bring sons to glory, but you can't bring somebody someplace that you yourself are not there. And so I believe the challenge is to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. And the, Jennifer, when she said she was going to preach on that 1 John 1, 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. But light should be the green light, red light of your entire life. Because if you walk in the light, the, the, the love is overflowing. When the love stops overflowing in your life, you need to be honest and say, something has surfaced and I need to be honest and admit that it's there. In other words, if you're in a room uh, and it's kind of dark and dim, but you're walking in the light that you have, you might see a table over there. You don't know if it's a table or a piano. But I tell you what, you turn up the light and you go, oh, it's a piano. That's our responsibility. To say that we walk in the light that we have, but we, we always want more light. Show me, God, anything, anything that as the light shines brighter, I want to be cleansed of that thing and walk in, in, in the reality of walk in the light as you and I have fellowship one with another. And there's no room for deception there. It says if you say you have no sin, you're a liar because nobody's arrived yet. And you walk in the light that you have, but it doesn't mean you don't need more light. None of us are there yet. So, but it was fitting and proper for him in all things that he would bring many sons to glory. And he was made the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. And the obstacles in your life are basically tailor-made for you. And I want to pray for the, for, for the replaced life to be more completely. Because the first thing that has to go in any of your lives is if you have the dual nature lie. How many know what a dual nature lie is? Kind of like there's a good me and a bad me fighting inside. That is bad theology. There's not a good you and a bad you. The bad you died when he died, right? And 
You were raised together with him. Can you still sin? Of course you can. But it's because you're being pulled out from that relationship. Temptation is to draw you out of the, of the we into functioning independent of him. So Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to move in a greater depth of the work of finished work of the cross. I want that replaced life. I want to, first of all, I repent of any duality. I repent of ever thinking that some part of me is bad and some part of me is good. I'm telling you that I am a new creation, that's the real me. Do I have potential to do bad? Of course you do. Uh, the world's full of temptation and it wants to pull you out of that relationship. But you've got to know who you are. And I want to break this thing that I keep seeing. I get phone calls from around the country with people dealing with condemnation and self-judgment. It's like, that's a sin. It's a sin to talk bad about what God has cleansed. What God has cleansed, don't you be calling it unclean. I receive forgiveness for talking bad about myself. It's sinful to talk bad about myself. I've been washed, I'm clean, I receive forgiveness for that. And now God, I wanna pray for impartation. And didn't even know this was possible until Jason got it and then Jennifer and then me, or me then Jennifer. Jennifer wanted it the most and she was last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but right now, I just re release that. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring us into the reality of that union and communion with you and no longer living separated in Jesus' name, that I am joined to the Lord, I am one spirit with him. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. In this life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave it. But from this time on, I wanna move from, from, the, from uh, what God did to me to what God is doing through me to basically focusing in on others that others are the, are the goal of the Christian life. And that gushy, lovey feeling that I felt with uh, the minute I walked in this morning, I just blanket your people with your love, God, for you, you love them deeply. And you're drawing them with cords of love even now. And you're saying, you're just saying, I want you to look into the mirror of the word and I want you to see yourself the way you really are. And, and not, to be a, not to be afraid to look at the at the reflection of your Genesis face. Your, your face is in a, looking at it as in a mirror, your natural face, your Genesis face, the face of your birth. God, let us see how beautiful we were in your mind's eye before we were formed in our mother's womb, before we had a chance to evaluate ourselves and to criticize ourselves. We were fused together with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. 
It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.